I had quite a few questions in the um, comment section of the video the other day, the introduction video, um, asking about how you get started. I've got a pile of these tiny balls of clay, this is just reclaim, and I'm going to throw them into the sort of shot glass things you occasionally see me glazing. They make great gifts to go with mug orders and they're good glaze testers. And the nice thing is you don't need to be too precise with them, they're quite quick and easy to throw. Um, so I'm going to try and do that mindlessly while talking about um, how you can get started in pottery and how I learned to throw. So first thing is, um, I learned from YouTube videos and a few people asked if I had any recommendations and I actually, firstly, the ones that were really useful I would probably struggle to find again because it was three years ago uh, but I'd imagine they're all the ones that will still come up if you search for you know, kind of centering techniques as well as obviously there'll be some new videos from the people who've come up since then but a lot of the names that are still around now well you know if someone's got videos that are five six years old now i probably watched them when i was starting the one thing i would say is rather than watching one person to see what they say and how they say to do it watch five people do it differently i found the way that most people say to center and open and pull walls up. It never really clicked. But every now and then I'd get a snippet from someone who was doing something slightly different and I'd try it and find that it worked for me. And so I probably don't throw in the most efficient way or in a way that um, many people would be comfortable with or would recommend. But if it works then yeah, if it works for you, then it works for you. So rather than a single recommendation, I would say to just check out the wide range of advice that's out there and try them all. Someone says, this is how they center, watch them a few times, try it, watch them, try it, watch them until it starts making sense and it'll either feel comfortable or it won't, but you'll have that in your head. For a while, I would probably have actually been quite a good resource on the various different ways that people recommend throwing it so long ago now that actually I can't really recall the different tips and tricks that people were giving out. But yeah, one of them will make sense to you and it might well not be the one that makes sense to the next person, but it doesn't matter. Um, so no recommendations obviously I'll try and post videos that are useful where I can to be honest I don't really do many throwing technique ones for that reason you know I've only ever taught myself and I'm not sure I do it the best possible way and having well I say I only share myself see you know, family and friends have had a play on the wheel and I've tried to explain to them how to throw. But it's hard explaining. It's the sort of thing that you just need to you know, throw a thousand cylinders, you're going to be a good potter by then. Just because it's time on the wheel that, that really determines how comfortable you are while doing it. Um, so that's that kind of covers the, the the mechanical part of it, which to be honest is that's the fun part. That's the part where you'll want to get kind of your hands dirty and you throw stuff and try different things and someone says can you make a teapot and you yeah that's a fun challenge. The part that's not so fun is getting to the point of selling. And if you're gonna do that someone asked and actually it's a great question do you need a social media presence to sell and the answer is no but um, you do if you're going to sell online through your own store so the way I see it you've got 
three options. One is selling at a physical location, whether it's uh, art fairs or wholesale and letting stores sell it. Um, both of those perfectly valid, they work for a lot of people. Uh, they turned out not to be a good business model for 2020, but I'm sure going forward things will return to something approaching normal. But um, yeah, in which case you don't need a, a social media presence. If you're going to a curated show, if you're selling at a curated show where the booths cost thousands or tens of thousands um, and there's an admission fee and you know the sort of class of person that's going to be going there is the sort of person that will pay the prices you want even if they don't know who you are then you don't need any form of social media there's actually an account that I've followed more or less since I started and I bought a mug off them um, I guess early 2017 if that makes sense or possibly yeah no it must have been kind of that summer and I'd have had a couple of hundred followers maybe at that point possibly less than that and they had a few thousand and this was a, a good show in London um, they were alongside a lot of other great work and charging a decent price for their work. And how many years on, my followers, my follower counts probably increased a thousand fold and theirs has maybe doubled in that time to give you a sense of how not prioritizing social media they are. And they were a full-time potter then, still are a full-time potter, obviously making uh, a decent living because they're paying rent with it and they're not even in a particularly cheap part of the country. Um, so you're going to the shows, you're selling in local shops in a nice area, you don't need to push your social media. And to be honest, if they hadn't had social media at all, it wouldn't have made much difference. Obviously I knew who they were and so I can track that, but I don't know if some of the other people that were at that show that I went to in London if they have social media or not I wasn't familiar with them I didn't look them up but the point is they were there and they were selling so don't need social media for that you also don't need social media if you're going to sell through Etsy or similar so we've got in the UK we've got a site called not on the high street which they've gone downhill a bit but it's a curated version so if you imagine Etsy, but with fewer sellers, but the work is individually curated. So for each product, there is someone who checks that it is handmade and it's not being drop shipped. And they even, they're not, they won't quite refuse to list products that have bad photography, but they almost do. So it's that sort of level. It's a they want the website to look unified and have good work on it. And they advertise heavily on TV, they send out glossy booklets, and if you're at the top of that website, you don't need anyone to know your name because they will see the product and you'll get um, you know, thousands, millions of eyes on your product and some of them will buy it. The problem with that is that in order to get to the top of any website, especially those sorts of ones when they realise that they can charge you for it, is that you have to put in time and effort and money to be the first name that comes up. It's slightly algorithmic, it's based on reviews and sales and things like that, so just by selling good products and having good reviews you will stand a better chance but um, I know it's true for Not on the High Street, I think it's true for Etsy as well you get um, paid spots at the top like Google um, 
results in Google search. You can pay for the top spot. You can pay for the top spot on those sorts of things. So if that's the route you wanna go, that is a very good way of getting your work in front of people without social media. Um, personally, I wouldn't recommend it because if those platforms change the way they sell and what you've been doing doesn't work for the, the new iteration of the platform, you've lost pretty much everything. Um, you're better off building That's not very well wedged. I'll just decapitate that tomorrow. Very easy to needle off once it's dry. Um, yeah, you want, ideally, you want your audience to be yours. Uh, there's a certain element in which the only thing you control is your mailing list. So followers on any platform, social media or um, other shop sites, uh, they're not your audience and you can't contact them directly often without being in violation of the, the terms and conditions on those websites. And if those websites cease to be or decide they don't like you anymore, if Instagram deletes my account, or YouTube deletes my account, um, I can't contact any of you through those platforms anymore. I have a mailing list. Um, it's not my primary way of selling, but it is a very useful backup, and it's a way for people to opt in. Um, so of the three of those ways of selling, my preference has been the, the builder following on Instagram, build a mailing list, build your own website, sell through that, and you're in as much control as possible, um, but that takes time. And for kind of reference, I was posting most days for about, I think it was a little over a year maybe, but definitely around a year to get to my first thousand followers on Instagram. And it snowballed from there, and it's been three and a half years, coming up for four years since I set up that account, and I'm at 115,000 followers. And it's, the rate of growth has varied with various iterations of the algorithm. At one point, I was growing um, I think it was about a thousand followers a week and then it dropped, they changed the algorithm. <coughs> a lot of people went backwards under the new algorithm. I just slowed down kind of like to 10% of what I had been doing and it's back up a bit but nowhere near that thousand a week. But um, yeah, it's it takes time. You need to devote time at the start in which you're not going to get the sort of response that a big account will get. So if you're uh, in a university course or doing it part time, I would say you definitely want to try aim to get to the first thousand followers and improve the quality of your photography and your work and I mean, to be honest, the, the work is probably the thing that most people can do right. Um, and it's all the other things that you need to, to get right. And photography is absolutely key um, on Instagram, as is video quality. Um, and then on YouTube, obviously, it's flipped. You want to have good images when you're demonstrating stuff, but the, the video quality is key. You can do it all from a smartphone. Up until very recently I did. Um, this video is being recorded with on a Sony Alpha uh, 6400, uh, <coughs> 6, which is a very good kind of mid-range camera. I paid just shy of a thousand pounds for it, so it's not cheap, but it also isn't the kind of several thousands of pounds you'd have to spend on a 4K SLR 
and it's a perfectly capable camera. I would highly recommend it if you are in the market for something of that price. But if you're not, just use your phone. Um, but think as much as you can about the lighting. And I will link to the post, but a while ago I did a series of posts on getting started as a full-time potter. And one of the, the kind of key things was photography and lighting. And I use um, both for my product photography and for my video lighting, um, LED ceiling panel tiles. They're about that big, I guess 60 by 60 centimeters to go in the, the square ceiling panels of offices. And they are like LED soft boxes. So they give you a diffused light over that surface uh, pure white, they're bright, um, and the main thing is they're cheap. I can't remember the exact price, but I think it's 20 to 25 pounds for the equivalent of probably uh, maybe 200, 300 watts, something like that. Maybe it's not quite that much, but it's a couple of bright light bulbs worth. Um, and they work like soft boxes, you get the diffused light the light's the right colour and it's bright and it's why this video looks okay. I'm recording this in the evening, there's no natural light. I've got two um, of the panels in front of me. One's there and one's there so you can kind of see them casting shadows but they give a nice tone to the light and give a lot for the camera to work with so it's much easier to get decent quality. If you've got a home studio and you're taking product photography and taking videos and you want consistency, just get those. The, the ones I got require a small amount of budging to wire in because they don't come with a plug. Um, if you're not comfortable attaching a plug to the end of a bit of wire, then try and find a version um, uh, I imagine then you're probably better off just buying a designated softbox, which will have the advantage of um, you also have to find a way to mount them, these two things. They have um, some fittings, but they're obviously designed to go in the ceiling. So if you're the sort of person who quite likes modifying things to work in different ways, get them. If you don't like that and the thought feels you would dread, spend a little bit more and get actual photography LED soft boxes, but they make all the difference with um, photography and video, and they're not expensive considering. And especially if you're going to record it on your phone, because as I say, I've got a thousand pounds worth of camera here. But actually, if I didn't have the lights, I would be better off using my phone and the lights than I would be the camera without the lights, so you, you get a lot more bang for your buck with um, the lights than you do with better camera equipment if you haven't got the lighting. If you're going to use your phone, try and get a designated app like Android, there's a camera called Open Camera. Um, there's probably something for iOS, but I don't know because I want Android. It lets you lock focus, lock exposure, lock white balance. If you've ever watched a video, especially a sped up video, and it keeps focusing and defocusing and refocusing and focusing, when someone reaches, it'll refocus and it makes you seasick. That's because it's um, trying to, it's moving focus with what it sees, which I think pretty much all of the standard cameras will, because that's what you would want if you weren't doing pottery and reaching towards the camera to get a sponge but it's really not ideal for sped up um, sped up footage and it's such an easy fix the, the cameras are so much more capable sometimes than the software an open camera is a great bit kit like, it'll let you turn your camera into as close as an SLR as you can on a phone. 
in that you can set a whole bunch of variables like white balance and um, things that do make quite a big difference. So if you're going to do it on your phone, I recommend that or something similar um, or just find something that works for you. But that doesn't have to necessarily be the standard app. And if the standard app isn't working for you, try something else. Um, my photography setup is largely unchanged over the years. And again, I did it on the cheap. If you go to IKEA, assuming you currently can go to IKEA, um, they will probably have a bargain corner. And the bargain corner is um, things that have been separated from the rest of their product or are damaged or something like that. You can buy tabletops. So I've got one of these stained white wood IKEA, I don't know if it's a desk or a tabletop, but it's a, a surface. And they'll sell you that for basically nothing because the rest of the, the product that it's supposed to be with is broken. Um, so you, they just they will have a rack of sheets of material like that that work as great uh, makeshift counters and you can either use them as backgrounds or you can buy pretend wood wallpaper, which is what I'm using mounted to a board. I reckon my whole photography setup cost me definitely under £100, probably closer to £50 than £100. And I mean, it's not as good as a professional product photography setup, but I think it's better than those um, pop up light tents that you can get, which are about £100. So consider that. But if I was recommending anything to someone starting out now, it's that you need to get your photography and videography and editing of both on point because that is what really counts on social media. There's lots of great potters making great work who are not documenting it well enough for anyone on Instagram to be interested in it. Um, and that time while you're building the first thousand followers and trying to actually get some traction on anything, that is the perfect time to be working on your photography. Don't think that you'll get one right and then work on the other. So work on your products, work on your photography, work on your social media, do that all simultaneously. And there's a very real chance it will take a year before you get anywhere, even if you're doing it full time, because that's what I found. I was doing it basically full time um, at the start and I was experimenting and posting my experiments and admittedly I didn't start off able to throw so I had to teach myself that as well and I was fortunate enough to have saved up enough and be in a position where that was an option for me. If it isn't an option for you, do it in your spare time if you really want to but there's no guarantee that throwing more hours at it will help that much, in, at least in terms of social media. If you're gonna go out and kind of do hustling to sell in physical locations, then more hours might mean more sales. But um, yeah, I would budget a year to, to really get to the point where it's viable. And if you can build that into time where you've also got something else going on, all the better for it. I'll link to the series of blog posts I did on getting started. And I might revisit them. I'll have to reread them because I wrote them a few years ago now. And things are different in terms of my position and social media has changed, but possibly not that much. It's hard, to, I'll have to go back. Um, and if my recommendations have changed drastically, I'll put that alongside the links and I'll revisit them properly soon. I imagine most of it's the same stuff. 
which is basically what I've said plus engagement you want to build an audience it's not a coincidence that a lot of the people who are doing well on social media are sharing a lot and this is not my idea in any way I did not I was not the first person to think of doing this and in fact I got it from Kurt Hamley um, some of you might have followed him for long enough. I don't think he really does them anymore but his group pots which are now called bark texture for probably copyright reasons but three years ago they were the group pots and they're sodium silicate with dark clay to make a really really thick slip that he blow torches and expands to crack to look like bark fun technique um, there's not actually, it's not that complicated but if, you, if you're just starting out in pottery you don't know even what to search for to start that as I was at the time, I had no idea and he did more or less a full write up on what he'd done, what you needed to do to achieve it and this was one of the first times I'd seen someone take a product that they were selling and explain exactly how to make it and if you're coming from a place of scarcity and you think that there's only a limited number of customers and you don't want to tell your competition how to make your your work that doesn't make any sense um, but what I sort of came away from that realizing is that I could now make a group pot but if I did I wouldn't have I'd have learned from it but I wouldn't have contributed anything to the process so I did in fact make one it wasn't as good as his but more to the point not only was it not as good as his it wasn't mine either whereas the times when I've seen a technique with no explanation and then quite often in trying to figure it out I've come up with something that's different but based on that first thing um, which the swirlies were to be honest I saw someone do it with far more control I had the wheel speed set too high I had to move my hands that fast to avoid overlapping and then that's what you get the person who I based it on did it better than I did so much so that they got the pattern that they wanted and it wasn't the straightforward source but that's where it came from but it would be a bit different if they'd have said if someone said here's a swirly thing and here's how to do it you kind of you can learn from it you're giving beginners something of value and you're not costing yourself anything you know your competition whatever that means to you isn't going to see that and steal all your customers with it that's just not how it works I mean maybe if you come up with the world's greatest glaze and you're a very small pottery account and you share it and then everyone's using it then maybe you've lost out but that probably isn't going to be the case and I mean I share pretty much all my well I share all my glazes some of them I don't publish the recipes because I, my kiln fires slightly weirdly I'm not sure the thermocouples reading correctly um, but it might be I'm not entirely sure I know what my firings do for me and some recipes might not work for other people just because they're weird but I, my logic is the only people you're hurting by not sharing are the beginners, which is me three years ago. I hugely appreciated all the people that put all the content out there. And I understood the, the, <coughs> the people who kept everything secret, but, but I suppose my experience of it has been that if you share stuff, you'll build a relationship with the people that are, are viewing it beyond just isn't this pretty and that is a good thing in the long run so I would recommend going forwards 
to at the very least consider sharing more than you possibly feel like sharing sometimes just because it it benefits the people who are coming up after you and I genuinely don't believe it will cost you much if anything um, it sometimes feels scary but I I I don't think I think that's your brain lying to you rather than an accurate assessment um, I've run up cables and I've pretty much run out of things to say so I'm going to call it quits there.